Good morning, welcome. Welcome to this time of worship here at First United Methodist Church of Wichita Falls, where we are united in our love for God and our love for each other. It's a great privilege to welcome you to this time of worship as we gather together, both in person and online, wherever we might be. I hope that if you are here in person, that you were greeted warmly when you came in, and I hope that you were handed a worship guide because it's got information about how we will uh, do worship this morning. It's also got things that are happening in the life of the church in the days and weeks to come, and it's a great chance to just find ways that you can get uh, connected. If you're worshiping with us for the first time this morning, or you're visiting from out of town, or you're just checking the church out, what a delight and joy it is to have you here, and uh, thanks for being here, and I uh, hope that you're able to make a meaningful connection as, as you are here, and I hope that you'll uh, see someone, if you see someone around you that you don't recognize, uh, those of you who are part of this church, I hope that you'll help uh, get somebody um, acquainted with, with this congregation. Uh, if you are worshiping with us on TV this morning or through our live stream, it's a delight to have you as a part of our worshiping congregation as well from wherever you are, maybe here in town or uh, outside of town or outside of the state somewhere. Wherever you are today, we're delighted that you are a part of the congregation and um, you can find the worship guide online uh, on the website or on the YouTube um, channel. There's a link there. I want you also to know that today we're ce celebrating the Sacrament of Holy Communion. So if you are worshiping with us remotely, you might find some bread and some juice, something that can represent the communion elements that we will receive later in worship today. Um, and have that ready uh, to go. Uh, those of you who are in, in the room, we will celebrate that a little later. Uh, this Wednesday is our first Wednesday meal. This is a monthly gathering uh, that we do. Uh, Six o'clock this, this Wednesday will be uh, in the atrium this week. Uh, gathered together for uh, for dinner. Uh, it's uh, it's cheap, it's good, and it's a great time to get together with the church family. So I hope that you'll make plans to be a part of that. We are kicking off a new worship series this morning that we will uh, use uh, throughout the summertime, an opportunity for us as United Methodist Christians to dive deeper into some of the core things about being United Methodist that we believe. Um, some of you may have been Methodist a, whole, a long time. Some of you may be new to the United Methodist Church. Uh, this is an opportunity to sort of refresh ourselves with some of the things that are uh, vitally important to us in the ways that we understand and practice our faith as United Methodist Christians. And I look forward to sharing uh, the first installment of that with you later this morning. For now, I invite you to find in your worship guide or in your hymnal our opening hymn, Blessed Jesus at Thy Word. I invite you to stand as you are able as we sing together. Failed to mention just a moment ago that uh, Reverend George Harrison this morning is uh, guest preaching for one of our colleagues here at another church uh, nearby, and so we'll miss her this morning, but wish her well as she delivers God's word. I invite us to continue to remain standing as we celebrate and affirm the things that we believe using these historic words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, 
and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. So hopefully you have heard by now that tomorrow uh, begins a uh, ministry, a month-long ministry here at our church called Reading with Friends. Reading with Friends is um, based on a, a ministry of the United Methodist Church that was started in Dallas about 25 years ago called Project Transformation. Sarah Pelican uh, was part of uh, Project Transformation back in um, well, a few years ago and uh, as a college student. And, uh, and, and what what's makes this program interesting is that it's a combination of, um, of, of partnership between the church and interns and volunteers. And so Sarah was a Project Transformation intern. You worked in Dallas somewhere um, over the course of a, of a summer. And, um, and so this ministry, uh, Reading with Friends, is um, also an opportunity for, um, for, for young people to to participate in uh, helping disciple and helping um, students, elementary school students, um, become more proficient in reading, especially over the summer months. And so we wanted to introduce you to a few of the interns who will be with us uh, this summer. And I uh, wanted you to know who they, who they are. And, and with me this morning are a, a couple of, of our interns, and you may see others of them uh, throughout the morning. So uh, good morning. Come on down. Um, in the meantime, Sarah, would you just uh, say hi to us real quick and then uh, pass it off to uh, let our interns introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Sarah. So if you come to Reading with Friends, you'll probably see me. If you come volunteer, I'll be the one kind of showing you the ropes. And so here's two of our interns. We do have six in total, and I'll tell you a little bit about the other ones after they're done introducing themselves. Uh, so my name is Kyle Noe. Uh, I'm from Wichita Falls, and I uh, go to Midwestern State University. My name is Natasha Clark. I'm from Wichita Falls, and I go to Perry View A&M University. And so um, some of our other interns, um, we have Matthew and Regina and Jamani. Jamani might be coming in. She needed a, anyways, we had some issues. She's coming, so if you see her after church, you're totally welcome to come up and say hi to Mani. So we have seven, um, six volunteer or interns that are there who kind of let lead the program while the interns are reading with the students, so, or while the volunteers read with the students. Even though we have interns, we still need the volunteers, though, because the volunteers read with the students one-on-one, -on -one, and we don't have enough interns for them to read one-on-one, -on -one, so we still need volunteers. But you will see these friendly faces if you do come and volunteer. So what I think I just heard you say is that the volunteers get to come and just have fun reading with the students and the interns get to do all the, the work. Exactly. Okay, so yes. that seems like a deal to me. So friends, if you have not signed up yet to volunteer uh, as a Reading with Friends mentor, uh, you can do that starting tomorrow. We'd love to have you be a part of that. Uh, it's going to go on all month, and Sarah can get you definitely hooked up. You can come one time. You can come every day. It's um, really whatever your schedule allows, we'll be happy to do that. And while you're there, you'll get to meet this uh, amazing group of young people who are interning and, and keeping the program running while that happens. Your giving makes that possible, by the way. We're paying these interns and, and making sure that they've got um, uh, resources throughout the, the month, and, and your giving and your support of this ministry, like Reading with Friends and other ministries of the church, makes that happen. So we're really grateful to you for that. More to say? Uh, yeah, I 
I just hope you all come out. It's a really um, special program, I think, and so I'm glad that we have the opportunity to host it here at our church. Can I offer a prayer for our interns and for this ministry that's getting started? Gracious God, we thank you for these young people who are uh, giving uh, of themselves and uh, serving uh, you, you in this way by uh, giving a place for these children to come and have a safe, nurturing environment where they continue to learn how to read and, and develop their reading skills. Thank you for a church home that allows uh, this to happen, that invests in children's uh, academic and education development and a place where they can be loved and supported and cared for. And I thank you for each of the volunteers who will come and, and read with the students, whether it be one time or many times. God, I pray that you would help make vital connections between these adult volunteers and the students, that, you might even, uh, that we might even make new friends uh, and see the love of Jesus uh, spread among us as we uh, share that love together. Uh, bless this ministry and the work that we do and continue to bless our church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you help me thank Sarah and her team and uh, wish her well this week? invite you to be in spirit of prayer by quiet in our hearts and be mindful of God who loves us and who surrounds us at all moments and who is more eager to hear from us than, and than we are to speak to God. So let us begin our congregational prayer with it, which is printed in our worship program. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for the encouragement we find through the scriptures. They are how we find hope and faith in this life. Through your divinely inspired word, we are taught how to be your people and how to accomplish the work you have called us to do. May your word be a lamp for our feet and a light to our path today. Open our eyes to your truth. Give us understanding to keep your commands and to put them into practice. Amen. As we continue in our prayer time this morning, 
Um, I ask that you continue to keep Linda Gibson in your prayers as she is in rehab. Let us take a few moments for silent prayer and meditation. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Your greatness is seen in all of the world. You are greatly to be praised. And we thank you for who you are, the wonderful gifts you share with us, and for your abiding presence. You have made the sun and the moon and the stars. You have set them in their places. And you have created this wonderful world. How is it that you have looked so favorably upon humankind, but you have, and you have created us in your likeness and gave us a responsibility to care for your created world. So help us to live into the people you created us to be and to reflect you and your goodness to one another and to the world. On this Sunday, which the church calls Trinity Sunday, we are reminded of the mystery of your presence in the world. You have revealed yourself to us as creator, parent, as son and redeemer, spirit, sustainer. And yet you are more, much more. So help us to see your greatness and not to limit you to a box or try to domesticate you. We pray for the concerns in our hearts this morning. We pray for those who are sick, those who may be facing surgery, recovering from illness or surgery, who need a touch of wisdom and guidance in their lives and for those who are grieving. We pray for those who feel alienated from you and other people. We pray that the hearts of the frustrated and the weary will be smoothed by God's healing grace. We pray for our Reading with Friends ministry, for our children who will be participating, for the adults who will be volunteering, and for our interns. And we pray for this church during this time of transition, of the changing in the staff membership and with some members moving to different communities. In faith and hope, we pray all this in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, praying together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the, glo and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes from Paul's second letter to Timothy, chapter 3, beginning with verse 14 and continuing through 17. I encourage you to follow along in your own Bible or a Bible app on an electronic device that you might have. Or if you have neither one of those, we invite you to take the Pew Bible that's in front of you, and it's on page 213 in the New Testament section. Let us listen that we may hear God speaking to us. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believe, knowing from whom you've learned it, and how from childhood you have known the sacred writings that are able to instruct you for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for repro reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness so that everyone who belongs to God may be proficient, equipped for every good work. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So as I mentioned earlier, over the next few weeks, during the months of June and July, uh, summer school is going to be in session here at the church as we 
explore together some of the core concepts of United Methodist doctrine. We're going to look closely into the things that we believe and the things that make us who we are uh, as United Methodist Christians. And my hope is that we gain a better appreciation for the things that we believe, as well as a better working understanding of them so that we can have better conversations with people who may not be as familiar with, uh, with what we believe as United Methodists. And if you're um, out of town during some of that time, you can catch up uh, through uh, the live stream or through a, a worship service on demand on the YouTube channel. I hope that you will make a point over the summer to stay connected to the church even while you're traveling because these nine core concepts that we're going to talk about uh, really kind of all fit together and give us a real sense of, of who we are, and we're going to explore that over the summer. Now, I've been United Methodist my entire life, and I've participated in the ministries of the church my whole life, Sunday school and summer ministries and camps and youth ministry and, and all these things. And these things have been foundational for me as a, as a Christian growing up, and, and the Bible was always the foundation of these ministries, learning about God through the Bible stories that we would, would learn in Sunday school and, and camps, learning about biblical characters, and learning to see myself in the biblical story. Now, I've heard it said recently that United Methodists don't believe the Bible or don't take the Bible seriously. And I can tell you, I cannot think of a single time in my life as a United Methodist when that's been my experience. Like, the Bible has always been the, 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 the foundation for what we do. And I think it's true that we United Methodists have an approach um, to, to the way that we talk about the Bible, an approach to the way we study the Bible that may be different than, than what people from other faith traditions, um, the way they study and learn. And, and maybe that's where the disconnect comes from. I've heard people use this phrase from time to time when it comes to the way they study the Bible. They'll say, the Bible says it, I believe it, that settles it. Now, I believe that God speaks to us in Scripture, absolutely, 100%. But a phrase like, the Bible says it, I believe it, that settles it, makes me nervous. And I'll tell you why. Have you ever read the Bible? I mean, have you really actually read what the Bible says? Because there are passages and verses in the Bible that are incredibly difficult to understand. Passages and verses that have been studied and debated for centuries by people with way more knowledge of these things than any of us in this room have. And, and, and these passages are still interpreted and understood in a variety of ways. And so, if the Bible says it, I believe it, that settles it, then riddle me this. How does that approach help you reconcile a verse like Deuteronomy 23, 2? No one born of a forbidden marriage nor any of his descendants may enter the assembly of the Lord even down to the 10th generation. That means that anyone born to unwed parents would not be allowed to attend worship or participate in church nor any of their descendants for the next 400 years. That's not much of an evangelism strategy, I don't think. What about Leviticus? 29. If anyone curses his father and mother or mother, he must be put to death. I am grateful every day that my parents did not take that one literally. Here's one from the New Testament. Paul's instructions in 1 Timothy 2.11. A woman should learn in quietness and full submission. Friends, I can tell you that's not how Jennifer and I raised our daughter. And I bet many of you were not the same either. Does that make us heretics? Those are just a few examples. There are lots of others. And many times when confronted with verses like this, the response of the, that settles it is something like this, well, things were different then. Or that verse is not about literal silence or literal death. It's meant to be understood figuratively. But didn't you just say, the Bible says it, I believe it, that settles it, except in those times when it doesn't settle it. So we agree that Scripture is set in a particular place, in a particular time, written for a particular audience, in a particular purpose. We agree that there are things we know today that were not known 6,000 years or 2,000 years or 500 years or 100 years ago. The context matters. That's the point. And what was happening in society at that time 
What's, what's God trying to teach the covenant people of God? What faithfulness looks like? This is what the Bible is really intended to do, and interpretations matter. There are dozens and dozens of versions of the Bible, translations, but none of them are exact translations of the Hebrew, Greek, or Aramaic. There are early manuscripts of Scripture, but they're copies, they're not originals, and it's possible that a scribe could put an accidental dot in one little place where a line should have gone, and it changes the entire meaning. Now, I'm not mad at anybody who says the Bible says it and I believe it. I'm right there with you. It's the that settles it part that I struggle with. And I've often found that when I dive deep into Scripture, the answers and the comfort um, are very clear to me sometimes. They're very clear directions sometimes. And at the same time, I discover I have more questions and more reasons to keep learning. Which is why I love so much our Wesleyan United Methodist approach to studying the Bible. Theologian Albert Outler gave language to this a lot of years ago. He was trying to describe the approach that John Wesley used, the approach that can be summed up in four words. Scripture, reason, tradition, experience. Let's see what this is about. Scripture, reason, tradition, and experience. These are sometimes referred to as the Wesleyan quadrilateral, but be careful because that's a bit of a misnomer. A quadrilateral is a geometric shape with four sides and four angles and squares and rectangles or quadrilaterals. And because of this, there's this false belief that Methodists view Scripture, reason, tradition, and experience as equal. But we don't. That's not how the quadrilateral actually works. We believe that Scripture is the primary way that we understand our faith. The starting point, the focal point. Scripture is the lens through which we make sense of our faith, and everything else that goes into our study of faith starts with the Scriptures. It's first, it's primary. I want to be clear about that. And 2 Timothy chapter 3 reminds us, the intent of the Scriptures is to make us wise for salvation through our faith in Jesus Christ. They are to help us grow in our knowledge and understanding. When Paul says that Scripture is God-breathed, it means that it's divinely inspired, something that, that God is, is speaking to us through these ancient and sacred texts, telling us something about what faithfulness and covenant relationship with God and other people is supposed to look like. Scripture is the beginning of the conversation, but our approach to the Bible is not a one-sided conversation. It's not where we just take it and say, well, okay. I think God expects for us, in fact, I think God longs for us to participate in this discussion. And so John Wesley offered three conversation partners that we bring to our study of the Scriptures. The first is reason. God created us with brains. And we use our reason to ask questions to call out things that don't make sense or we don't understand. We use our reason to make discoveries, to figure things out, and I think it pleases God as we join in the conversation and as we try to make sense of the mystery. We'll never solve them all on this side of heaven, and that's okay, because there are always going to be more mysteries to find, and that makes uh, part of the fun is that we get to have these conversations with God. The approach of that settles it, shuts the door to that conversation, and it keeps God at a distance. Another is tradition. Now, specifically, this is tradition of the, the church, the big C church. This is not traditions of a particular local congregation, things like a, a bake sale or, or things the church does every year, or specific ways the church might worship. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the traditional understanding and teaching of the church throughout the centuries. How did early church leaders wrestle with this question? How did, how did the church try to make sense of this over the centuries. Tradition keeps us grounded in a greater story. Rather than getting swept up in some fad, it's not that we're, we're bound to the tradition of the early church, but because those have, haven't always been proven right, but understandings have changed. But the tradition helps provide some historical context so that we understand our questions today as part of a much bigger conversation. It's not just about us. It's about how we, as a church, have wrestled with this throughout the centuries. And then finally, uh, experience. And this is specifically experience of the Holy Spirit. This is not like my individual experiences and my limited worldview, but this is about how the Holy Spirit 
is moving in me and around me and pushing me into new places and new ideas and new understanding. And my experience of the Holy Spirit is tested with other people's experience of the Holy Spirit, just as on the day of Pentecost, when the believers were filled with the Holy Spirit and empowered to speak all of these different languages, but equipped for the same purpose. So it's not about individual here, it's about our experience. We'll all have different individual experiences of the Holy Spirit and different ways of understanding, and so we come together and we look for, for patterns and we look for things that we have in common and we look for things that lead us in the same direction or in the same place. Scripture, along with reason and tradition and experience, our reason and tradition and experience examined through the lens of Scripture. This is God's invitation to us to join the conversation, building on the foundation of Scripture. We bring other perspectives into our study as we seek to understand who God is and what God is doing and how God wants us to be a part of it. I love this approach. But I'll be the first to tell you, an approach like this can get a person into trouble. There was a guy in the late 1400s, early 1500s by the name of Mikolaj Kopernik. Born at a time when the attention of the world had turned to exploration and trying to make sense of this place where we lived, Mikolaj Kopernik had an insatiable desire for learning. He developed a fascination with the stars in the night sky. The prevailing wisdom of his day was that the earth was the center of the universe, that everything in creation, including the sun, revolved around the earth. This was what was being taught in the schools. This is what was the accepted doctrine of the church, justified by certain interpretations of Scripture in that day. Trying to find a way to understand this vast emptiness known as space, Kopernik looked to a simple and ancient idea called heliocentricity, while scientists and theologians and church leaders doubled down on the firmly established positions and doctrines. He ran experiments and posited a theory. And he didn't tell many people at first, since going against conventional wisdom is kind of risky. Heretics and heresies are often outcast, both in the church and in society. Finally, his works were published more widely. The Revolution of the Heavenly Bodies is what it was called. But the man we know today as Copernicus died without knowing the impact that he had had on the world. Despite its truth proven to be true, the book was banned <laughs> until 1758, some 200 years after Copernicus died. This work completely changed the way we understand the movements of the stars and the moon and the sun, at least the ones we can see. See, Copernicus' idea put him outside the mainstream, even outside of most church circles. So his ideas would force the church to recognize that science and scripture could coexist, even complement each other. This quote accurately describes what a faithful approach to scripture looks like. If God has given humanity the brains to delve into the mysteries of the universe, our reluctance to do so because we might have to reorient our thoughts is unfaithful to a creator who would give us such capabilities. When presented with better evidence and understanding, turning a blind eye to new knowledge is not only choosing ignorance, it's unfaithful. Friends, God has given us the gifts of reason and tradition and experience to help us in our understanding of the scriptures. Let's embrace John Wesley's approach to understanding and studying the scriptures, this model that invites our questions and our insight. Let's embrace an approach to scripture that feels more like a conversation so that we can grow in our love for God and in our knowledge for what God wants in our world. And most of all, let's show the people around us, and the people of our world, how seriously we do take the Bible by living lives that reflect the love and the faithfulness of the one true and definitive word of God, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. May this word live in our hearts and transform our world. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
I invite our ushers to come forward so they may receive our gifts and tithes and offerings and present them to God. As they come forward, you're welcome to give electronically as well. This information is on the back of your worship program, or if you're watching on YouTube or TV, this information is on your screen at this time. And as always, I want to say thank you for your support of the ministry of this church. As has been mentioned this morning, Reading with Friends begins tomorrow. A week from tomorrow begins our band camp, our band and art and music camp. And you will have the opportunity to serve and to be engaged in young people's lives. We believe as United Methodists, we are support the church with our prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness. I encourage you as a part of your offering today to seek how you can contribute to these ministries through your prayers and through your service. Let us pray. Lord, bless these gifts that they may be used for the ministry of compassion and mercy. Bless the people gathered here who bring their gifts and their lives in service to you. For we offer ourselves and our gifts to you. Amen.
invite you to be seated. Friends, just as our approach to the scriptures invites us into a conversation with God and a deeper understanding, our participation in the sacrament of Holy Communion invites us to the table of our Lord, to be in the presence of God, to be in the presence of each other, and to be in the presence of the saints that have gone before us as we celebrate together and share in this sacred meal. And you are welcome to this table whether you believe in this literal bread turning into a literal body, or if you just believe it to be symbolic. There's no prerequisite for you to come to this table in believing a particular way. All that's required is that you love Jesus and that you seek to want to be in community with Jesus and with your neighbor as we celebrate this together. Because we remember that Jesus celebrated this meal for the very first time with his friends who were definitely imperfect, people who did not have it all together. And he was gathered with them together at a table where they were celebrating a meal together and then he took a loaf of bread from the table. He gave thanks to God for it. He broke it in their presence, and he said, Take this bread and eat it. This bread represents my body, which we've broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then he picked up a cup from the table. Again, he gave thanks to God for it, and then he gave it to his disciples. He said, Drink from this, all of you. The contents of this cup are symbolic of my blood, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so we give thanks today for this mystery that Christ has died and Christ has risen and Christ will come again. And this opportunity we have to celebrate and to share in this sacred meal together. I invite you to pray with me. Gracious God, I pray that you would pour out your Holy Spirit on those of us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and juice, the gifts that we have in the room plus the, the gifts and the elements that are, in, that are going to be uh, taken by those um, worshiping with us online. We pray that you would fill these gifts of bread and juice with your Holy Spirit, that they would become for us the body of Christ, that we might be redeemed by the blood of Christ. By your Spirit, we pray that you would make us one with Christ, one with you, one in ministry with each other and the whole world, until Christ comes in final, final victory and we feast at his heavenly table. All honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Friends, because there is one loaf, when we break it and share it, this is a means of becoming one body. This is the body of Christ given for you. And when we take of the cup, we are participating in the joy of Christ's salvation. This is the the cup of salvation, the cup of joy, the blood of Christ given for you. I want to invite those who are coming to serve our communion to come forward, and as they're doing that, I would remind us all that this is not uh, the United Methodist Church's table, this is not First United Methodist Church's table, this is God's table, and you are invited to come and receive these gifts. The gifts that we will receive are an extension from the table that I was just at. Uh, they're all gluten-free, and that way everybody can participate without having to do anything special. We're going to invite you to come as the ushers direct you to the communion rail. You can kneel here or stand, whatever's most comfortable with you, as we uh, serve you these, uh, these gifts. We pray that you would extend your hands in front of you as if you were receiving a gift, for that's exactly what this is. This is a gift of God's Spirit that we offer uh, on behalf of God so that we can be united in our faith together. Uh, If you're here and you want to make an offering, we don't require that, but if you want to be, if you're led to make an offering, you're welcome to do that. All offering uh, rail, uh, communion rail offerings are designated for missions here at the church. Friends, the invitation is offered to you. I pray that you will respond with joy and gratitude as you come and receive these gifts that God has offered to us.
invite you to pray with me. Gracious God, we thank you for your gracious invitation to meet you at this table, to be connected to you and to each other and all those around the world who have received this gift today or at some time. We pray that it would bind us together, that it would remind us that we belong to you and that we are called to serve you in our world, to represent your love to those around us. So we pray that it would strengthen us, nurture us, so that we might go forth from this place. We pray that your word would be implanted deeply in us, that, it, that we would be able to live out what your word teaches us, that we would reflect the love of Jesus, your true word. We pray that in all things we would be instruments of your peace and that we would bring life and light to the world just as Jesus did and taught us to. We pray that that would transform our world, make it a more hopeful, peaceful, loving place. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I invite us to, uh, to find in our, our uh, worship guide and our hymnals, um, our closing hymn, our hymn of invitation and sending forth, Break Thou the Bread of Life. This is, again, a reminder to us that the bread we receive today isn't just the literal bread that we've taken in, but the bread is the word of God that, is, that we receive, the word that is planted in us, and the word that gives us nourishment to go and be the people that God calls us to be. I invite you to stand as you are able as we sing together. Just outside the door here in the gathering area is one more opportunity for you to put your name down and sign up as a Reading with Friend volunteer. Quite honestly, even if you don't do that, if you want to show up tomorrow, and we'll, we'll find a place for you, trust me on that. But we'd love to know that you're coming. That would be very helpful to us as we get started on this ministry this week. I also hope I'll see you on Wednesday at our first Wednesday meal. It's a great time of fellowship and just a time to connect together as a church family. My friends, more importantly than anything else, I pray that our lives would be a living reflection of the love of God that is revealed in the scriptures and revealed in Christ Jesus, that we would show the world what the word of God is simply by the ways that we reflect that word and that love to the people around us. So go in peace. May the peace of Christ go with us all. God bless you. We'll see you next Sunday. We love you. Amen. Amen.